H. Stone is a rock star, by which I mean he is a geologist. <laughs> he has been investigating all kinds of natural global processes from the perspective of his scientific uh, experience for more than 35 years. He has both a BS and an MS in geology from Waynesburg University and West Virginia University. He has recently come out with a book which is an extraordinary tome. It is called Inconvenient Facts, The Science Al Gore Doesn't Want You to Know. And it is a rigorous refutation of Al Gore's famous or infamous inconvenient truth. He has been featured on television shows all around the country, but we know him as one of us, a longtime PLC regular. Please welcome Greg Wrightstone. Well, thank you so much, Colin. Um, uh, H.L. Mencken warned us of governments and government institutions uh, creating imaginary hobgoblins of alarm with which uh, they use to frighten the population so they will accept otherwise onerous and harmful regulations that the population otherwise wouldn't accept, things like the Paris Climate Accord. And it's because of that today that Loman Henry invited a scientist to speak in front of a political gathering because the hard left has actually hijacked the scientific process and are now using it as a political football. So that's why I'm here today to talk about this. So there is science involved. But there's also political science, which we'll look into. And before we get into it, uh, I will tell you that I didn't set out to write a book. I really didn't. I set out to seek the truth. Because as a geologist, I knew that some of what we were being told about climate change was just wrong, and I suspected that other things were. So the book was actually a result of that search for the truth. Um, so let's get started here. So we've all heard of a 97% consensus of, uh, on climate change. There are several things that we all, most scientists agree with. Uh, number one, CO2 has been increasing for at least 100, 150 years. Uh, that CO2 increase is predominantly uh, due to man's causes, mostly fossil fuels. Also, we've been a long-term uh, temperature increase. Uh, there are things, though, that set us apart, what I'll call the climate alarmists. Uh, believe that the temperature increase we've seen over the last 100 plus years is primarily caused by man's forces and that the temperature increase that we've seen and in the future is going to lead to significant uh, climate degradation and what I call the climate apocalypse events. Uh, on the other side are climate skeptics like myself uh, who I'm so sometimes derided as science deniers. Uh, we're not. We, we use science. My book is in uh, based on science, facts, and data. Uh, most of us believe that the temperature increase that we've seen so far is primarily driven by the same natural forces that have driven temperature increase for millions of years. And many of us believe that the temperature increase and the CO2 increase that we've seen are leading to mostly beneficial uh, effects. And that's really what uh, the talks that I've been given recently are talking about how rising CO2 and increasing temperatures are benefiting the earth and humanity. Next. Uh, so this is a slide. We started gauging CO2 levels at Mauna Loa in 1958. CO2 level have increased since the uh, beginning of the Industrial Revolution. There are only two numbers I want you to remember. 400 is one of them. We're at about 400 parts per million today. Uh, it, it, that's an increase from about 280. Uh, the climate alarmist will tell you this is uh, a dangerous increase in CO2 levels. But again, we're, I like to look at things in a longer term geologic perspective, and we'll see. Uh, next, we'll look at uh, CO2. Uh, th these are CO2 emissions going back to 1750. And you'll see that we really didn't start increasing a whole lot of CO2. Really, it was the post-World War II era in the mid-40s where we really started uh, putting out significant amounts of CO2. But again, we want to put this into the longer term expect, uh, uh, significance, and that's next. Uh, before we get there, this is the uh, uh, CO2 emissions, uh, mostly from uh, fossil fuels, a little bit, interestingly, from cement manufacture. Next. But again, we put this into a longer term perspective. 
Uh, you'll see here our 400 parts per million. Uh, we'll look over the last 400,000 years of data. You can see CO2 levels decrease during the ice ages and then increase during the warming periods like we're in now. But again, let's put this in just a little bit longer term perspective. Next. Um, next. We'll take a look now at 600 million years of data. And you'll see that the 400 parts per million we're at right now, remember I said 400 is one I want you to remember. It's actually, in, we're actually CO2 impoverished. We don't have too much CO2, we don't have enough. The average CO2 level on Earth prior to our current period was 2,600 parts per million. Six and a half times where we are today. High CO2 levels are not dangerous. Uh, we've had them as high as 8,000 parts per million in the past. And interestingly, submarines, the U.S. Navy, uh, submarines often exceed 8,000 parts per million on the sub. And the U.S. Navy doesn't think that's dangerous for our sailors. So actually, looking at the long-term perspective, and let's take a look at the next slide. Uh, looking at the long-term perspective, we don't have too much CO2. We don't have enough. We're actually CO2 impoverished. This is the scariest chart in the book. This is um, 140 million years of CO2 data. We started at about 4,000 parts per million. We're on a straight line down to that. That red line at the bottom is what I call the line of death, below which plant life can't survive. We were headed right to that. It's not entirely sure we wouldn't cross that line of death during the next ice age. Granted, uh, none of us except Loman and Henry will be around by then. But, uh, and I'm not so sure about Loman, but uh, if he keeps eating that bacon. But uh, this is a dangerous slide. This is showing us that we're really in CO2 impoverishment. Next. Um, and again, we want to put things, I'm going to, this is a great slide showing how we need to look at things in a long-term geologic perspective. Uh, this is a chart, everything you see from now on, red is temperature, blue is CO2. Uh, this is temperature from um, 1850 to present. Uh, this is the chart that most of the alarmists will use to bolster their argument. And just looking at this graph, one could say, well, maybe there is a correlation between CO2 and temperature. Well, let's take a look at this in a little bit longer perspective. Next. So this is, this is the longest thermometer-based temperature history on Earth. It's called the Central England Temperature Record. It goes back to the year seven, excuse me, uh, 1659. And looking at this, we're looking at CO2, and we're looking in blue, temperature in red. And we can see that the temperature warming trend that we're in actually started in the year 1695. And that's the other number I want you to remember. 400 parts per million, 1695. That was the depths of the Little Ice Age, the horrendous, horrific Little Ice Age. Uh, half the population of Iceland perished uh, during the Little Ice Age. Uh, the River Thames froze solid many times. The last time the River Tem Thames froze was in 1812. So we've been in a, a, a long-term warming trend, but the warming trend started in the year 1695 long before the first SUV made its way to the corner grocery or the Indian fired power plants. So uh, this long-term trend for the last first 200 years necessarily had to be naturally driven. And what the climate alarmists and groups like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, want you to believe is that natural driver that had been driving temperature increases since 1695 suddenly ceased at the beginning of the 20th century, and it's all our fault. It's our fault due to uh, our uh, production of, of greenhouse gases. And you know and I know that's just not so. Those same natural drivers are occurring today. Next. Uh, interestingly, if we look back the last 10,000 years to the beginning of the, of, of the interglacial warming period, the end of the last ice age, uh, I've numbered uh, on the far right, there's a red dot there that shows where we are today in terms of temperature. I've also numbered nine other warming periods very similar to the one we're in right now. Michael Mann from Penn State and the IPCC tell us that the warming trend that we're in right now is unprecedented and unusual. And I'll argue as we go through this that it is neither. It's neither unprecedented nor unusual. Five of the nine other warming trends had higher rates of warming than we're in right now. And all of them higher, higher uh, uh, temperatures. Uh, Scott Pruitt, over the last few weeks, uh, my, my editor Gordon Tom's in the room, and I was getting tests, texts from him and others a few weeks ago about Scott Pruitt. Scott, he says, Scott's quoting your book. Scott came out and was saying, uh, how arrogant is it 
for us to believe that we know what the ideal temperature is. Uh, to which Michael Mann re uh, responded, well, of course I know where the, what the ideal temperature was. It was the temperature before we started adding CO2. Well, what was that? Right in the middle of the Little Ice Age. And we know how that worked out. In fact, the worst of the Little Ice Age, 600,000 people died in one year in France. It was bad. Um, that would not be good. Uh, I'll, we'll argue that actually warming temperatures, as we'll see in just a moment, have historically provided some of the best uh, uh, increases in civilization and technology. Next. Um, so this slide, I, one of the favorite parts that I had in the book, and it might actually lead to an, 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 an entire book, is the, the relationship between temperature and civilization. Um, we see that during each one of the temperature increases over the last uh, several thousand years, we see that the great civilizations rose up during times of warming, and then it got cold, and man, bad things happened. Uh, crop failures, famine, pestilence, mass depopulations occurred. Uh, during the Minoan warming period, the first of, that was the, the rise of the first Mediterranean and the, the rise of the first Egyptian uh, uh, cultures, the Akhenaten in Egypt. And then they got into the Greek Dark Late Ages and those civilizations collapsed. Uh, during the Roman warm period, of course, the time of Christ, uh, we saw the Roman and the Han Dynasty in China rise up. And again, it got cold. If you're, if you're Emperor Loman Henry and it's a warming period, you can, you can feed your population. That's good. Everybody's fat and happy. When it gets cold and crops fail, you're not going to be Emperor Loman for very long if you can't feed your subjects. So that we see that occur in times of, of uh, warmth and, and prosperance. People can think, they can dream, they can invent, and that's what they do. Um, and so what we have here, uh, as we got out of the, the high Middle Ages and medieval warm period, uh, we saw that uh, people could do the, the great rises of technology. And then many of you, I saw the 5,000 year leap on some of the tables out there where we've had 5,000 years of technology advances squeezed into just the last 100, 150 years. Now, Clausen that wrote the book doesn't attribute to warming, but I think that uh, if we were still mired in the temperatures of the Little Ice Age, we wouldn't uh, be able to prosper if we can't grow fruit, food like we have next. Next. Um, we're going to go quickly here. Uh, the last half of the book deals with climate apocalypse events. Uh, we, you've heard it all, increased toenail fungus, increased poison ivy. Uh, let's, let's start. We'll go through some of these quickly. Next. So I live in the real world. So what I've done is the, the climate alarmists use climate models that can't effectively measure climate to predict climate apocalypse events in the future. Well, what I did in the book and here, we'll look at what's actually occurring in the real world, what's actually happening, and I'll argue that if we're going to see some of these negative events, shouldn't we see some indication of that now? Next. Uh, and again, this is, these are climate models uh, in red, 100 climate models that overpredict warming from the actual numbers by two and a half, three times in the tropics. So again, climate models that can't model climate. Next. Um, and again, I posted this on uh, on uh, LinkedIn on Groundhog Day that actually Punxsutawney Phil has a better record of, of, of predicting temperatures than what, what the climate modelers do. So uh, next. Great, great slide. This is from NASA, and most of the information is from uh, NASA, NOAA, and the others. This shows the greening of the Earth. More than 50% of the Earth is prospering, is greening, vegetation is increasing. Only 4% is browning. That's a good trade-off, 50% getting greener. Most importantly is the Southern Sahara, and I want anybody out there with an iPhone, Google NASA greening in Sahara and see what you get. Next. Up to 300,000 square kilometers in the southern Sahara, former desert are turning into a lush grassland. Gazelles, even amphibians are moving back in there. This is a great story that should be trumpeted, and you're not going to hear about it. So again, NASA, uh, Google NASA greening in Sahara and see what you find. Next. Um, so we also we see that hunger and famine is proposed as, a, as one of the climate apocalypse. Let's take a look. Is that so? Next. So we see here, these are grain production. I'm not going to argue that uh, uh, temperature and increasing temperature and rising CO2 are the sole um, cause of increasing food, but it sure hasn't hurt. And we see this time and time again. So it's a combination of uh, CO2 fertilization, rising temperatures. Next. Ne 
And again, uh, corn production in relationship is going up in relationship to CO2. Next. Uh, part of that is attributed to a trend in lengthening of growing seasons. So uh, more crops can be planted, more plantings can be made. Killing frosts end uh, earlier in the spring and arrive later in the fall. Next. Uh, and again, CO2 is plant food. This is a chart. The full chart is in the book. It shows that an increase of 300 parts per million of CO2 will lead to a 46% increase in food production, crop, crop weight. That's a good thing. That's something that you've never heard, perhaps, or you've heard about it, but the mainstream media will not tell you. This is, we're able, because of CO2 increases in rising temperature, and here with CO2 alone, we're going to be able to feed a hungry population and a growing population, and that's, that's really a good thing. Next. Uh, we also hear that, and just about every alarmist declares that droughts are going to be a significant impact. Um, we see the droughts and others are decreasing because soil moisture increase has been increasing, and the, uh, and the experts tell us it's because of climate change. I know it sounds counterintuitive. Droughts are in long-term decline, and next, even the most significant and severe droughts uh, of the 20th century, uh, we see 30 of them here. Nearly all of those occurred prior to 1960. So we have rising temperatures, increasing CO2, but yet droughts, the big severe droughts are declining. Next. We also see, I like to talk about forest fires. Everybody thinks that forest fires are increasing. And they think they're increasing because of climate change, because we're told that by the mainstream media. Yet if you look at the facts, and if you look at the actual experts that deal with fires, they tell us that forest fires, wildfires, have been in a long-term decline for more than 100 years. And those experts tell us they attribute it to climate change because of the soil moisture increase across the world. And no, I thought, before I started into this, I thought forest fires were increasing, as probably many of you do. This is from the uh, National Interagency Fire Service, showing the number of forest fires. Next. And if we look at the, uh, if we look at the area, this is world, this is global uh, area burned for the northern, northern hemisphere. Again, this is from the Canadian Fire Service. They state categorically that the decrease they see worldwide is due to rising temperatures and increasing CO2. Next. And again, heat waves. The EPA states that heat waves are not increasing. We saw a huge spike in heat waves in the mid-30s in the Dust Bowl era. Um, but they are not increasing. We, a good case can be made that actually heat waves are decreasing. Next. Uh, this is a, a chart showing more than almost 1,000 stations that NOAA runs uh, across the United States. This is the number or percent of stations that reached 100 degrees or more. Uh, and you can see, since the 1930s, we've been in a pretty steady decline from those extremely hot days completely different from what we're being told. Next. Interestingly, we're also told that heat and global warming will cause an increase in mortality. Nothing can be farther from the truth. This is a chart, uh, the largest study of its kind in late 2016. They looked at 74 million temperature-related deaths and found through 14 countries, including the United States, and they found that 20 times as many people die cold-related deaths as heat-related deaths. Global warming is going to save millions of lives or premature death. And that's incredible and it's not being told. Next. And again, this is extreme weather-related deaths of all kind. Uh, we've seen a 98% decrease over the last 100 years in climate-related deaths. That's huge, and it's exactly opposite of what we're being told. Next. And again, this is a, the left light, and the alarmists like to take a kernel of truth and twist it. This is from a report. The headlines uh, were 160,000 additional deaths due to heat. What they failed to report was there'll be 260,000 deaths spared because of rising temperatures and, and cold-related deaths. And, and again, they, this, is, this is what they report. They take us, uh, so actually 100,000, this is from the European Union, uh, that 100,000 actual lives will be spared because of warming temperatures. 
completely opposite of what they've twisted it to be. Next. So I'm going to conclude here 30 seconds early. Uh, moment. So there we go, Colin. Uh, so I want to tell you, sleep well. You're not causing the destruction of the planet. And um, I'm a contributing writer to the Cornwall Alliance, uh, which is a Christian-based group. Uh, the, the, the founder came to me and said, your book is completely in line with our philosophy. We believe in a, a prospering world uh, that we need to use God's, all of God's creation for the betterment of mankind and do it in a responsible manner. And I think what, what I've shown here today is the earth is prospering, humanity is thriving. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with rising temperatures and increasing CO2. So again, sleep well. Thank you very much.